Thank you, Gerard. So today, as we mark the uh, 30th anniversary of the Armenian Bar Association, we're really excited that um, we have fresh faces and young bodies and agile minds. Um, some of us are smart enough to sit in the back row because uh, that's the, the, the older crowd. And um, when I look around at the audience, when I hear an Alexan and a Zepu, um, how can we not be but blessed with all of your presences here? It's early in the day, the momentum's gonna pick up. As lunch doubles these numbers and dinner tonight triples and quadruples these numbers, Knowing that, you know what, sometimes you wake up early in the morning on a Saturday to come do things and hear things that doesn't, you know, don't interest everybody all the time. Very, very, very privileged to have you here. I'm not going to talk much about the Armenian Genocide Reparations Committee other than to say this. It was 20 years ago, only 20 years ago, that the first of the reclamation efforts was initiated in United States courts. Those were the New York Life cases and the AXA cases. They were brought by a man who was a pioneer in, in, in certain ways. Um, and there were settlements. There was a settlement for $20 million and a settlement for $17.5 million. This Bar Association of members in this audience today were both supporters and also critics of those efforts. Because how is it that you trade, how is it that you trade lives for pennies and dollars? And is 17 and a half or 20 enough? You know what we've learned since then? Those were probably the brightest days of reclamation efforts. Brightest in the, in the sense that everything else has been a struggle. Let's be frank, after those two settlements, whether it be the next life insurance case, the Munich Re one, whether it was the Dresner case, the bank case, whether it was the, the land case, Bakalyan, there's this doctrine called federal preemption. I'm not going to get into the details, we have experts, Matthew and Thaddeus Stauber, who just walked into the room, that will talk a little bit and drill down a little bit into both the art and science of genocide reparations efforts and what those challenges are. But this thing called federal preemption that judges invoke is that the Armenian genocide is not an accepted fact that presidents and executive administrations have either been agnostic about it or in opposition to it. And so as much as we think that we have transcended the day or the time that we should be pushing our politicians and policymakers for genocide recognition, the fact that that hasn't happened has been a big hurdle. But we have to employ everything, arts and education and social media and all those things. But what we're going to be hearing this in less than half an hour, especially from, from Mr. Stauber, is once you get into the door, let's say you overcome those challenges of federal preemption, uh, there is a whole host of other things that we have to grapple with. I mean, I, it, we've only been in this for 20 years. And 20 years is just a speck in time. You know the Jewish Holocaust reclamation efforts? Those didn't start, or they started right after the Holocaust. The Armenians sort of piggybacked on those efforts. Those are still ongoing, but the big difference, the big difference is the denialism that's, that's continuing. That has been the stumbling block for litigation efforts and negotiation efforts. The armistice wasn't even signed. And we then, and, yeah, well, we barely signed, and then the, the, the Jewish groups were already at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City at the, at the Jewish Claims Conference already. Germany had already abdicated, abdicated not in the war,
but were contrite, saying, I'm sorry. Billions of dollars, not two or three or four or five. How about 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 billion dollars? Paid since and now and in the future. And dare I say in perpetuity. So, so what we the challenge for, for this organization is that is that we don't have a successor state to the perpetrator state that says, I'm sorry, let's get let's let's get along. So these are really, 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 really tough things that we have to overcome. I will close with this, the reports in there. We've had these conferences. We've talked theory. We've talked intellectual exercises. Humble to say that in the last year, not, not really that announced, but we've made two filings. One in an international forum, United, State, United Nations Committee, based on the ICCPR, the International Covenant of of uh, civil and political rights. For the right of an Armenian man, representative of others similarly situated, born in Turkey, in historic Armenia, to be able to return to his homeland in order to observe his religious rights. In order to be able to go to that church in which he was baptized. In order to be able to go to that monastery and that convent where for hundreds of years before his people went. He was denied. We filed an application in the United Nations Committee. We were then uh, confronted with some obstacles that were considering appealing. In the meantime, newly filed case in the United States District Court, Central District. It's a live case. We're not, um, it's a, a little delicate right now because again, there are challenges. There are challenges on jurisdiction. There are challenges because you don't have a, a Germany in Turkey. You don't have a successor state that says, I'm gonna try to make amends. So, so what we're going to do, uh, I mean, we're going to take a little break in about 15 minutes, and I'll make the introduction then. But the two panelists are now standing side by side in the back, and that's Karanian and Stauber. Karanian's going to give you a broad scape. He's going to touch your soul. He's going to make you think. And he's going to say to you why it is that we are here today and why, why it is that we have to bring these cases and these claims. Stauber, on the other hand, so I'm, I'm sort of making the introduction. <laughs> we're, 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 we're lucky to have this man here because this man represents in the looted art cases, usually the Hungarian or the Austrian or the Spanish sovereigns, the states, or the agencies and instrumentalities, the National Art Gallery as a result of Nazi looted art. So he's going to give us an insight, actually. It says quite a bit about the man, because he's going to be, he defends the state. He defends the agency and instrumentality that some of us in this group are actually make mounting challenges against in the Armenian situation. So his, his talk is, you know, the road to recovery is a winding path. Really, really blessed to have uh, that type of insight and, and modesty for, for him to be here. We're going to take a 10 minute break, but um, just quickly to business. Uh, I usually don't stand up because Gary Momjin's here from the nominations committee. We have a 17 member board. Every year we, we fluctuate, I mean, we, it's a rolling six, seven people. Um, so this is the time that we are going to open the floor for nominations to the six openings on the Board of Governors of the Army Bar Association. Six people are up. Two of the, of the six whose terms were up this year have decided graciously and with the utmost humility not to stand for re-election. And those two are uh, Sarah Bagirian, a longtime uh, executive member of the Armenian Bar, and Kathy Osia who's also a co-vice chair. 
with those two vacancies, uh, we had four incumbents, each of whom expressed his and her willingness to stand again for election. And then the nominations committee did a vetting process. And as a result of the expressions of sustained interest to be on the board and new interest to serve for the first time, the nominations committee with the board's approval is suggesting and we have ballots. And before I name their names, it's not an inside deal or at all, I don't want to sound defensive, there's, there's room for others too. If from the floor you think somebody is worthy of a nomination to the board, please feel free to make the nomination. We'll see if there's a second. I only ask that that person have demonstrated not only interest in the Army and Bar Association, but service and time and commitment and continuity. Um, but you're, you're, you're free to do as you think is appropriate. The, the six are um, Elizabeth Mirza al Dijani, Alex from Chicago, and she's the, currently the Secretary of the Executive, Alex Herak Bastian from San Francisco, one of the new nominees, Harry Dikranian, former chair from Montreal, Suren Israelian from New York City, Gerard Kasabian, our incumbent chair, and Rafi Salafian, one of the founding members of the Bar Association from Chicago. So, um, uh, because you know, Gerard is a, a candidate, and because Liz also is a candidate who serves on the uh, nominations committee, uh, I open the floor um, to any suggestions or nominations that you may have, and I'll give you a minute or two to think about it, instead of just going and closing it in four seconds. A motion, I, I buy the motion for unanimous consent. Motion for unanimous consent. I did make the motion. Second. Second. Ayes. Aye. Nays. Congratulations. All right. So we're now going to start the first panel of the CLE. Uh, I'm not going to introduce the speakers. Look, look at your booklets. Look at their pictures. Look who they are. But let me set the stage this way. 100 years is a speck in time. It's infinitesimal when you put it in the context of the Armenian nation of thousands and thousands of years. But more importantly for our purposes, 100 years is not a long time not to wait, not necessarily to initiate, but to redouble efforts of seeing if there are ways of recovery of some of all that was lost. In the 2000s, not in the 20th century, not in the 1990s, but in the mid-2005, 6, 7, into the teens, United States courts have entertained applications from those who were victims or the, or the successors to the victims of the Herrero genocide, which preceded the Armenian genocide by 10 or 11 years in United States courts. Apartheid reclamation and restitution efforts. Apartheid that's been around for generations in South Africa. United States courts there too entertain their applications. Jewish Holocaust, as we mentioned at the end of the last session, started in earnest only 20 years ago, and there's no end in sight. But maybe perhaps the, the oldest, American Indians and African Americans. Those two claims have been formalized in the United States courts. Uh, the only reason I say this is we're not late to the game. 
this is the game. And that it, it's ripe for smart people with very, very tight claims and not emotional claims, claims that are going to be recognized under our common or statutory law, survive the pleading stage. That's the name of the game. Survive the pleading stage. Take discovery. File motions. By getting over that, it's too, it's something, I mean, that's really a, easy for me to say, just survive the, 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 the pleading stage. That is, we'll talk about, well, once you get in, that doesn't mean you won. Then the real battle starts. So what we have today are, uh, is Matthew to my immediate left, just joking in the, in the hallway there. He's gone to historic Armenia many, many times. He's a lawyer by training and by practice. But he's also a whisperer. He's a whisperer of the land. And he's going to bring it to life to you. He's going to show you then, he's going to show you now. He's going to show you something about yourselves and about ourselves. But it all can't be emotion, and it's not all emotion for him either, because he will have some specific suggestions as to how we can preserve the little that's left and perhaps to rebuild some of all that was taken. Thaddeus Stauber, who's from uh, Nixon Peabody Law Firm, is a, um, well, you'll see, I mean, he's going to talk to you can already see. But he's, he's the guy that you want to hear from. He's the guy who represents the foreign sovereigns. He's the guy who's going to say, okay, I get, I get you Armenians, not Armenians, I get these claims. And as much as I agree with them at their base, the road from A to B is going to have to go over the Himalayas in order to get to B. His job has been so far, perhaps, maybe I'm going too far, to make sure that, at least in his cases, perhaps similarly situated plaintiffs and claimants don't get from A to B. Not, not in an immoral, not in, in, in any type of malevolent way. But we're all raised in the American legal system. We went to American law schools, we took oaths, and we're practicing. And we have the law that's in front of us. And we have clients. And we have loyalties. So the Armenian Genocide Reparations Committee of the Armenian Bar Association, I don't think has ever had a man like Stauber here. We're very happy. Very happy. And as you'll see through his elegance, that we have, will have a lot to learn. His context will be Nazi looted art. Mainly, not totally, not exclusively. That you had these families who claimed that their grandparents or great aunts, pieces of art were taken by Himmler or were taken by somebody else, and now they're in Austria, now they're in Hungary, now they're in Spain, now they're here, they're in the North Simon uh, Museum. But we have to come to the point where, okay, how, how is it that other than the emotion that I mean, there's morality, just give it up, you can't just give up the art. They, they, no one's just going to give up $100 million worth of paintings. So what are some of the practical things? What are some of the practical takeaways that we can actually think about implementing in anything, not that this group does, but as lawyers that we may want to think about doing in our reclamation efforts. So we're starting with an overview of the land from which your people came and our people came. I invite Matthew Carney. Some of you know, and it's a name that I'm going to ask each of you to commit to memory. Yashar Kemal. He was born in 1923, in the waning days of the active phase of the genocide, in a place that we now know as South Central Turkey, not too far from Adana. 
Nashar Kemal. He was a novelist, an intellectual. He was a proud, proud person. And during the course of his career as a writer, he was awarded 38 book awards. But that's not why I want you to remember this man. During the course of his career, he became the first Turkish citizen to be nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. But that's also not why I ask you to remember who this man is, Yashar Kemal. Yashar Kemal died three months before the centennial of the Armenian Genocide in 2015. And when he died, his obituary was published in the New York Times and it was broadcast on the BBC, and he was identified as a Turkish citizen of Kurdish descent. And that contrasted with how he was known during his life by so many Turks who called him nothing more than a mountain Turk. The reason I ask you to remember Yashar Kemal is because what this one man did when this man was just 28 years old, in the month of June, 1951, he traveled to Vaughan. And you know, it's really not so unusual that he would choose to go to Vaughan. Some 150 years earlier, part of his family had traveled from the Caucasus through Vaughan. And this part of his family was in Vaughan in 1918. So this man, Yashar Kemal, he knew about the culture of Vaughan. He knew about the Armenians of Vaughan. And when he returned to Vaughan to visit in June 1951, he was astonished and he was horrified to learn what was going on. The 1950s was a time when the Turkish government was engaged in spasms of destruction of Armenian artifacts. And it was no different in Vaughan in 1951 when Yashar Kemal was there. And he heard rumors that Akhtamar, Surkhash, the Cathedral of the Holy Cross on Akhtamar Island, was being demolished. He couldn't believe it. He got in the car, he went down to the shore, he hired a boat and took him to Akhtamar Island. And as he approached the island, he could see the soldiers milling about. Turkish soldiers, conscripts, laborers, who had been charged with demolishing Akhtamar. And as he got off onto the island, he saw one of the chapels had already been demolished. It was sitting in a pile of rocks. And he st stormed forward and found the commanding officer who was ordering these conscripts to commit these crimes. And he demanded this 28-year-old novelist demanded that they stop him. Who was he? Some people would say he should get a job. What did he do? He sits and writes. Is that a job? But he stood his ground. He was told, no, you have no right. Who are you? You have no political standing. I have my orders. They're signed. They're sealed. Akhtamar will be destroyed. Yashar Kemal left the island. He went back to Vaughan. He found the commanding officer of that officer. And this 28-year-old nobody demanded that they stop destroying Akhtamar. The commanding officer went back to the island the next day. And based on the power of Yashar Kemal's plea, insistence, this novelist, this 28-year-old novelist, stopped the destruction of Bakhtar. June 21, 1951. Let me know. I ask you to remember his name and remember what he did, not only for what he accomplished, but for the example that he serves to all of us here. 
what one man could accomplish through his bravado, through his insistence, through his courage, through his fearlessness. This was a time, as it is again today in Turkey, where standing up for one's rights could lead to the deprivation of one's liberty, or worse. But he did it. You know, three months ago, I published this book, The Armenian Highland. And I tell Yashar Kemal's story among the stories of other people, other heroes of Armenia in this book. And invariably, I am asked why I called this book The Armenian Highland. And as an attorney, I know that sarcasm is not an appropriate response. Juries don't like it, judges don't like it, people don't like it, we misunderstand you. And so I take a deep breath, and I give the straight answer, and I explain. For the past 150 years, first the Ottoman Empire, and then the successor state to the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Republic, has engaged in a sort of a trifecta of crimes against the Armenian nation. The first crime, which began in the late 19th century, was to eliminate all the Armenians. The second prong of this trifecta, after having eliminated the Armenians, was to eliminate the memory of the Armenians. And that's accomplished by eliminating the place names. And the third prong of the trifecta is to eliminate the cultural evidence of the Armenian nation. So the first prong we've already dealt with in many other conferences. But the second prong, eliminating the place names, that's where my title for my book came in. In 1880, the Ottoman Empire instituted a policy, and they said, the word Armenia shall not appear in any school books, in any government documents, it shall not appear in any official capacity. And perhaps the most notorious example of the implementation of that policy in the late 19th century occurred in Harpet, when a fledgling Armenian college that went by the name of the Armenia College was compelled to change its name, to change its name to the Euphrates College. In October of 1915, during the genocide, Enver Pasha issued a decree. He decreed that all non-Turkish, non-Muslim names, place names, of provinces, towns, villages, rivers, mountains, shall be changed to Turkish names. Why? To eliminate confusion. Thousands of Armenian names were changed, were wiped off the map. And if you think I'm exaggerating, we only need to look as far as a boast from the Turkish government in 1981. The Turkish government said 12,000 names, place names, have been changed. Non-Turkish, non-Muslim names, and they mean Armenian, and they mean Greek, and they mean Assyrian, have been changed to Turkish names. Today, decades after those policies were first implemented, so many of us refer to ourselves as being from Anatolia. How did that happen? For thousands of years, the region stretching from Artsakh in the east to Cappadocia in the west, from Trebizond in the north to Mesopotamia in the south, that highland plateau was called by everybody all over the world the Armenian highland. But in the 1940s, pursuant to this policy, the second prong of eliminating Armenia. Pursuant to that policy, Armenian Highland was purged from the maps. 
what took its place? Eastern Anatolia and Southeastern Anatolia. And now we, many of us, not all of us, have been duped into thinking that we are from Anatolia. The propaganda worked. And so that's the answer to the question, why I call it Armenian Highland. I'm trying to reverse some of this propaganda that has been thrust upon us by the people who would have murdered our entire nation. That's only the second prong. The third prong, and this is, by the way, the region that I'm talking about, of the Armenian Highland. I get carried away speaking sometimes, I forget to advance this slide. But the third prong, We've eliminated the Armenians, the Turks say. We've eliminated the memory of the Armenians by getting rid of all their place names. What's left? What's left for the Turks to do to, commit, to, to finish committing their crime of genocide, which is ongoing, is to get rid of the evidence. The evidence has to be removed. And we're going to hear in the next presentation about the response to Nazi looting of treasures, and the response to getting the treasures back. But what the Turks did was something different. The Turks also did that. The Turks looted our treasures. They took our gold. They took our property. Injurlik is a great example of taking of property. An entire military base built on land that was owned by Armenians. So yes, they took our property, and there is reclamation that can be made for those offenses. But also what they did was something that didn't happen in Nazi Germany. They destroyed for the sake of destroying. They destroyed to destroy evidence. They destroyed our churches and our monasteries. As I mentioned with Bach Tamar, which would have died, which would have perished. And just offshore from Bach Tamar, Narekovank, in the same year, demolished by the Turkish army. Yashar Kemal, we praise him for saving Akhtamar, but he wasn't able to save Narakovak, just 10 kilometers away. So my approach has been to address this third prong, this destruction of the evidence. My approach has been, through my limited resources, to stop the destruction. And my approach toward trying to stop the destruction, first of all, is education. Because if we don't know what we have in our homeland, if we don't know what's left of our cultural treasures in our homeland, then we cannot expect to ever save them. And so it was with great astonishment during one of my travels outside of Mush to a place called Surabgadabed, or which was Surabgadabed, that I saw in the distance in a wall something that looked out of place. I saw this Khachkar. And I am not a scholar of Armenian art, but when I saw this Khachkar from a distance of 100 feet, I knew this was something unique. And so I photographed it, and I emailed the image to a friend, Levan Abdoyan, at the Library of Congress. And I didn't get to see the expression on his face when he opened up the email and looked at the picture. But I can imagine, based on what he wrote to me, I can imagine that Levon's jaw must have dropped. Because what he wrote to me was, this is a priceless relic. If it's not on the wall of a monastery, then it belongs in a museum. And I'll tell you more about where I saw that in a few moments. So this was my approach. This is my approach, my ongoing approach for the past 20 years to try to shed light on what we still have, the cultural monuments that we still have in our homeland. And I started this journey back in 1997 from Yerevan, traveling to Istanbul and then traveling back to Van. And what I've discovered over the years is that you have to be a bit of a detective to find the Armenia in the Armenian Highland. And so I would travel to places like Sasun, and I would see it all before me, and it's glory. I'd see the mountains of Sasun. I'd see the mountain where, if Sasun see David was a real person, this is the view he would see when he looked out his kitchen window of his cabin. But as I traveled 
There were no signposts saying this way to the Armenian church, this way to the ruins of the Armenian monastery. And so I would find scenes like this, and I would hike, and I would journey up the mountain through the valley in search of whatever ruins I was told were not there, because invariably, if I asked, I was told there was nothing to see. And so I hiked the mountains of Mush. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four separate trips before I find Surp Alakelos. Because the first time I was told there was nothing to see, the second time I was told the, mud, the trail was too muddy, the third time I didn't start early enough, it was dark before I could reach it, and the fourth time, after four hours of hiking in 90 degree weather, I found Surp Alakelos. And what I ask you to do when you look at these images that I've taken of our cultural sites, our monasteries, is observe not just the ruins generally, but observe what is wrong with the picture. Look at this picture. You see a field. You see a meadow. You see a meadow covered with grass. But all around the base of one of the chapels of Surf Baracillus, there's no grass growing. Ask yourselves why. Why is there no vegetation all around the foundation of the church? Ask yourself why. What prevents vegetation from growing? And so I continued my hiking through places like Banak and Erzurum, which was almost completely purged of all of our artifacts, and places like Gonk, again in Mush. And, and you know, sometimes, I told you there's, there's no signs. And so I would ask for assistance. And traveling at this particular site in the mountains of Sassoon two years ago, a couple of Kurdish men approached me. What are you doing here? I'm here to see the church. I'm here to see the ruins. Oh, you've come to see my church. Your church? Yes. These two Kurdish men told me that they owned the church. And they were so proud to tell me that they had dug 20 caverns, 20 holes in the ground, looking for the treasure. And that excavation is why there's no vegetation growing around the foundation of so many of the churches. They said, we'll take you. We'll show you how to get there. Because again, this was another hike on top of a mountain that took a couple of hours. So they led, my, led me to the, to the church. And as we got to the church, and as we're walking around, it occurred to me that I was showing them more than they were showing me. Yes, they had led me to the church, but they were watching every move I made. They watched to see where I stopped, where I dwelled, where I looked. And it occurred to me, I was their clue for where they should dig next, where hole number 21 should be dug. And when I realized this, I left the church, and I walked some hundred feet to this pile of rocks and twigs. And I started looking down at my feet. And I got on my hands and knees and I looked close at the dirt and the worms. And I'd like to imagine that the very next day they came back and they started digging up this site and found nothing but more stones and worms. But that's one of the challenges that, that I faced traveling to our homeland, is traveling in such a way that I don't do more damage than has already been done. And so my approach has been to photograph and document what we still have left and to share it with you so that each of you can become the next Yashar Kemal, who, even if we cannot rely upon the courts, we can rely upon, perhaps, the power of our persuasion by shining a bright light on what we have so that its destruction becomes more unlikely, and so that its destruction becomes less desirable. This is the interior of one of our churches. You can see the floor has been dug up. This is not how it's supposed to look. The Armenians were not primitive. To the contrary, our architecture was cutting edge. Our architecture, in some cases, predated the Gothic architecture of Europe. Our churches look primitive today because they have been defaced. The facades have been removed. The stones have been stripped. The floors have been removed. 
This is what we have today. This is what we need to preserve, and we need to understand what we have. And don't think that this is something that only happened in the 1950s. In 2017, I traveled to Havav, and I discovered that a grave had been freshly dug, freshly exhumed, the Khachkar marking it had been broken in half. 2017, ignorance has a long life. The ancient Armenian quarter of Mush, when I first traveled there in 2014, was a little run down. By the time I returned in 2017, one building stood. It was replaced by a neighborhood of garish pink apartment buildings. And I thought, well, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. This remote part of Mush needed to be redeveloped because there was a lot of population. There was a large population that needed housing. But the apartments are all empty. The apartments were built on speculation and they remain empty. The priority, the imperative, was not housing. The imperative was removing the evidence of the Armenian community. So there's some progress has been made. Uh, Ani, for example, in 2016, was added to the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. I, I think that's progress. Uh, it's progress if you consider progress to be, let's stop the bleeding. It's not progress if you consider the types of renovations and so-called restorations that are being conducted on our churches. And that's uh, a topic for a scholar of architectural history. But these are some of the sites that I've visited that still remain, and I share them with you to, to emphasize that apart from Akhtamar, which everyone knows about, and Yashar Kemal, who you now know about, apart from that, we still have so many sites that warrant saving. And this is Akhtamar. This is the site that would not exist today but for Yashar Kemal. Our homeland is not depopulated. It has been mostly depopulated of Armenians, but it's not depopulated of all Armenians. Some of the Armenians stayed behind. They stayed behind because they were children who had been kidnapped, they had been orphaned. And today, as we travel through the Armenian highland, or what we often call Western Armenia, it's not difficult to find people who, after a moment or two, will explain to you that, yes, they have an Armenian grandmother. This man, this man was born with a Turkish name. This man changed his name from Diyarbakir. He changed his name to Armin. That is something that took courage, to change your name to an Armenian name in the Arabic. But I met these people throughout Western Armenia. I met these Armenians in Chonkush. Chonkush, not too far from the Dudan Gorge. That woman, the old woman, the woman who looks like she's a century old, she is about a century old. Her mother was a survivor. Her mother was a child survivor of the Dudan Gorge. At a time when the 10,000 Armenians from Chonkush were led to the Dudan Gorge and pushed to its bottomless depth, this woman's mother was snatched from the edge by a Turkish soldier. This woman's mother was 10 years old. And she was snatched from the edge of the abyss by a Turk by a Turkish soldier. And she must have been a very beautiful girl at age 10, because the Turkish soldier married her, made her his bride. And five years later, they had a child. This is the child. This woman is the descendant of the survivor of the Dan Gorge.
And sometimes meeting these hidden Armenians took a little bit of sleuthing. Just two years ago, I traveled to Havav in search of the family home of a woman who was looking for the home of her grandfather, her great-grandfather. And she had a map, and I just showed you the map in the previous slide. And she said, I know, where the, I know the map, I know where the house is, we're going to go find the house. And I thought, I've been doing this for 20 years, this is a bit of a waste of time. My first trip to Vaughn in 1997, I told myself I was going to find my grandfather's house. Nothing. So this woman says, yeah, we're going to find the house. We go to the house. It's a modern house. I said, Laura, this can't be the house. The house looks like it was built 20 years ago. We talk to the people. They invite us in for tea. Her house had been torn down a month earlier. And the people who are living in the new house tell us, oh, I had an Armenian grandmother who used to live in that house we pulled down. Here we are looking for somebody's house, and we find that they are part Armenian. And when we do the DNA test, because of course we brought a test kit with us, we do a DNA test, and it turns out that this man has a common ancestor with the Armenian American who I was traveling with. We were looking for her family homestead, and we found that she had some cousins who are one-eighth Armenian and seven-eighths Turk and Kurdish. So these are the sorts of painful experiences, painful and also joyous experiences that we contend with when we travel to our homeland because we're looking for evidence of our culture and part of our culture, I have to confess, is the people who are still living there. And I talk about these people because they are so important to what we want to do. What do we want? What is our overarching concern? Yes, we want to reclaim sovereignty over this land, but I think, I think our first priority is the Republic of Armenia, the Republic of Artsakh. Perhaps our second priority, after developing our independent republics, our second priority is to preserve what we still have in the Armenian highland. And how can we do that? We do that by enlisting as collaborators, as supporters, the people who are still there. Because if we can engage them to support us in our efforts, then we're most of the way there. The property is not abandoned. And so I traveled to places like Kishet, uh, which is the site of a military base. And we negotiate with the military commander, please let us on the base, we promise we won't take any pictures of the Armenian church that's behind the barbed wire on your military base. And of course, as we are negotiating entry onto the military base, and as we are negotiating that we will not take any pictures, I'm standing there with my camera by my side, clicking pictures of Khachiv Muraja and as he negotiates with the military commander, and Khachiv later told me, but he thought I was going to spoil the whole deal because they could hear the click, click, click of my phone. <laughs> As we went into Chonkush, we were demanded our papers. We're just going to see the church. Oh, we'll come with you. So two security officers follow us. As we go into other towns, we're greeted as returnees. We're told where to go. We're told what to see. We're invited into their kitchens. We're told by children, come look at the Armenian rocks in our yard. And they would have told us khachkars if they had known the word khachkar. These people who I was taught to hate, I came to understand that I needed to redirect my passion, my toward what was done a century ago, toward what is being done on an ongoing basis, and to understand that some of the people who are there could actually be our friends and helpers as we try to preserve our cultural heritage. These are the people who are there. These are the children who say yes, this Armenian heritage, this Armenian rock, 
is also part of our heritage. We're also proud of it. It's in our town. It's in our town square. And so let me show you some comparisons about the then and now. Traveling in Kars, I found this church, and I was astonished to see a standing church in the region of Kars, not too far from Ani, perhaps 20 kilometers away. And as I got closer, I realized the reason the church was in fairly good repair is it's being used as a barn. Sacrilege. But as I traveled to other villages throughout the Kars region, I learned about churches that had been used as barns, and whose owners said, let us keep this church, we need this church, it can hold so many bales of hay. But the government came in and said, no, we are under orders to destroy this church. And so I go back and I revisit my earlier thought about that church that was being used as a barn, as a sacrilege, and I think at least it's being preserved until the day when we can come back and claim it. Varagavank in 1914, Varagavank today. Surf Garabed in 1900, Surf Garabed today. Where did all the rocks go? The rocks were repurposed into villages, into the homes of the people who, who squatted on the land. And you can see when you look closely that there's carved stones. And here's the Khachkar that caught my eye. One of a hundred blocks of stone forming an indescript house is a Khachkar that belongs on a church wall or a museum. So Parakelos, the place I went looking for over four trips, and as it appears today. Harpert, the Armenian quarter of Harpert, as it looked 100 years ago, and as it looks today. Van, 100 years ago, the town of my grandfather. Van today. Sheep, the shepherd. No people. Horamos, 100 years ago. Horamos today. These churches are a thousand years old or more. They stood until the 1900s, 1910, 1915, 1950 at the latest. And they've only begun to crumble in the past century. And so I travel to each of these places and I share them with you so that you understand not only what we have, not only what we had, but also what we still have left to save. And we can remember and celebrate Akhtamar, but Akhtamar is just one of the 2,600 churches that existed in 1915. 2,600 churches that we had in 1915. And now we have about 200 that are still standing. I was in the Arabic here doing the renovation 2016, the Arbiter, 2015, the Arbiter, and then after the conflict with the Kurds, it rose again. So I put it to each of us here. Understand our history. Understand what still remains. And understand the legacy of people like Yashar Kemal that each of us, no matter how powerless we think we are, each of us has something to contribute to our homeland and to the preservation of our culture. Thank you.